Today, we embark on a most contentious topic. Which is better, cone burrs or flat burrs? Now, before we continue on, I'd ask that you would take a moment and hit the like and the subscribe if you've seen my content before and you enjoy it. Doing something simple like that really helps the channel, helps me create more content, helps me do more education, more product reviews, more the tutorials, things like that. Um, I also have Patreon down below that you can check out. But anyway, let's move on. So today's video, I wanna just chat briefly about the differences between cones and flats. I see all the time on forums online, people kind of lopping these massive statements into one of these types of burrs. Like, cones are always gonna be more chocolatey than flats. Flats are always gonna be more clear than cones. And that's simply not the case. There is no objective evidence to showcase something that broadly generalized. So so whenever you say flats have a certain profile, cones have a certain profile, that's not true. Both of them have incredibly different ergonomics. Both of them are gonna show up differently in different grinders based off the drivetrain, the motor, the alignment, the axle, the rotation speed. All of these different things contribute to how the coffee is going to taste. You can have flats that taste like cones. You can have cones that taste like flats. It all depends on how the grinder is constructed, how the geometry is, and a lot of the other minutia that contribute to the grounds coming out of your grinder. Get whatever's in your budget, what looks nice to you, and what you think has a good reputation as a company, because you're going to want something that you don't have to tinker with when you begin. But what I can assure you is there it's not as simple as cones equals chocolate, flats equals clarity. For instance, there is a lot of hype surrounding something like the Niche Grinder. They say it's very chocolatey because it's cones. It's 63 millimeter coney burrs. In reality, I've had better cone style shots from a lot of flat burrs. For instance, I got a pair out here. These are the base burrs from the EG1. Now, I know you're like, well, that's really expensive if you're comparing that to the niche. There are others in the similar price range, but this is a really unique situation. I've gotten to see some of the data from the particle distribution of this, and these actually act more like cones than they do flats. And what I mean by that is because of the dynamics of cutting and crushing in cone burrs, when you vary the RPM from something really low to something really high, say 50 RPM up to 500 RPM, you're going to have a big difference in the distribution of that curve. Smaller RPM changes have been shown to not be as big of a deal. Dr. Smirke was just telling me on the Weber key between 50 and 150, they didn't see many much difference, but there is much more difference between say 50 and 500 you have bigger shifts in the particle distribution as shown on the EG1 with this, between 500 and 1500 RPM with these burrs. In a similar way, you have those same types of shifts with cone burrs. Now, a lot of the flat burrs that I've seen, the data is not similar to this core burr, or this base burr from Weber. Normally what you see is the same distribution just shifting along the coarseness and fineness linear spectrum. Even when I say things like that, I'm assuming that cones give a certain profile and flats give a certain profile, which aren't necessarily the truth. I'm gonna speak in terms of a linear spectrum here. All right, so instead of like a Boethian eternal now where everything's kind of convoluted, we're gonna talk in terms of a spectrum, like everlasting time when we're talking philosophy of time, we're talking beginning and end, okay? So on this end, we're gonna say is chocolatey body, the blended flavors, on this end, we're talking clarity, we're talking tea-like bodies, we're talking florals, aromatics. So let's say that we have this hypothetical spectrum. Now, oftentimes people say cones make up this end, flats make up this end. You have, for instance, some of the Eureka grinders like the uh, Silencio can be about right here. It's very chocolatey, very coating. I think it has incredible espresso shots. I prefer that to a lot of the hyped grinders under $1,000 when it comes to traditional tot style of espresso. I think it does a great job with thick body, creamy body, chocolate coffees. So that's like here on this full spectrum. All the way over here, you also have flats. That's the only things in my opinion that can kind of get here are something like the brew burrs from SSP or the, the unimodal multi-purpose type burrs from SSP. You have all the way over here. So I think flats can kind of hit that whole spectrum. In my experience, I don't find that cones actually can, but I do think cones can get about to this part of the spectrum. They cover all of that kind of chocolatey, you know, thicker body type stuff, but they can also get into the brighter clarity, depending on the burrs, depending on the geometry. I have not used a Weber key, but I've heard a lot 
lot of people say they actually give more clarity than they would like. I think a big part of that is because of the uh, variable RPM going down all the way to 50. I know people know with hand grinders, you can get some really nice clarity from hand grinders that have cone burrs, like the Easy Presso ZP6. And a lot of that is that really slow RPM and how the burrs interact with the coffee. So you're able to get more clarity from these types of grinders. And in fact, I would put the ZP6 pretty, in the, pretty much in the high clarity area. What you have though is a higher concentration of flats live over here, a higher concentration of cones live over here. But there is a lot of overlap. I would argue that this con conical grinder has more clarity and filter brews than the Eureka Silencio. In this situation, this one has more clarity and is more tea-like and is more floral and more aromatic than this is. Granted, as they cool and the coarser you go, the closer they're going to get. So let's take a quick moment and just take a look at what a cone burr looks like. The dynamics of what's going on, the cutting, the crushing, and all of that, very different between this and a, and, a, and a flat burr. So what you have here is you have the cone and you have the collar that sits on top, just like so. Now, as you see, all of these grooves right here are going to dictate the feed rate of the coffee going into the burrs. And we call those pre-breakers. So what they're doing is they're pre-breaking the coffee before it gets down further into the burr set itself. So what we have Here's a heptagonal burr, meaning there are seven edges here, seven sides, just like so. And then we have these grooves in the sides. So a bean will go down, and as this is turning, okay, as that is turning, it will cause tension between the wall, the small entries here, and will cause the bean to kind of crack. And as it continues to be fed down through gravity and, and, and the centrifugal force and the other forces at play, as it feeds further down, it goes through more and more phases of cutting until it gets down to crushing, okay? So you have the finishing teeth down here, that are really forcing it to come out of a small gap. So when we're changing grind size, we're moving this burr or the collar, depending on the mechanism itself inside the grinder, up or down, and that's dictating how much of an aperture there is for the coffee to squeeze through, and that's going to dictate the grind size. Some uh, grinders, like the Brazza Sette, they actually spin the, co the collar around the cone. So there are different dynamics at play there as well. As we're looking at this, one of the big, one of the big things to understand is the amount of edges here dictate heavily the feed rate of the coffee going in. A faster feed rate would mean less of these spokes. So let's say, for instance, you had five of these spokes as opposed to seven. You would have a faster feed rate because the gaps between each spoke would be bigger. So beans can fit through faster. What this would mean is you would need more torque to grind it if you're using a lighter coffee. A lot of times for darker coffees, you would want something like that because you can grind faster. Darker coffees are a lot softer. They're a lot easier to break up. But what can happen is if you're using something like a pentagonal cone, with a light roasted coffee, the feed rate's really fast, it's gonna cause too quickly of a shatter, and you're going to have a lot more torque in order to push through that, which is a bit harder with a hand grinder or even on a motor of a typical grinder. That's why, for instance, a lot of the built-in Breville grinders aren't ideal for lightly roasted coffees. They have that five spoke and not really enough torque to take care of it. And in my testing and in my time doing coffee, it seems that there tends to be a correlation between more spokes is better for lighter roasted coffees and vice versa. Then when we look inside the collar here, we have initially kind of angles like so until it goes straight down for that finishing teeth. So what we have is that initial cracking and cutting and then it goes down to that final uh, cutting phase. So um, I guess I guess I kind of mix those terms up. Initially you do actually have crushing and then you have the final cutting phase. So that's kind of the terminology used in grinding is you have the crush and then you have the cut with the finalization. So we also have here an 83 millimeter Mazer burn as you see because it's a much bigger burr there are a lot more pre-breakers here to slow down the feed rate. If we kept a heptagonal design with something this big, you would jam every grinder ever because it cannot accept the feed that quick. It would go straight to the finishing teeth and that would take a lot of torque. So with flats, you have something very similar, all the same terminology, but what we're doing is two discs that are faced to each other. Early on, you had something like the EK43 that was a spice grinder. You would drop beans into a hole here and there would be an auger that would feed at very varying speeds, depending on which auger you got, it would feed the beans into the burrs themselves. So there would be something opaque here to disallow beans going anywhere else except inside these burrs. And as they're spinning, what you'll see is you'll see there's a gap here. And so we have the same idea with pre-breakers. We have these ridges here that are at varying angles depending on the burr set you have, and they're gonna crush the beans at different ways. So there's different tension points, different stress points, different fracture points that are gonna cause differences between the coffees that are being ground in it. So as it's spinning, it's causing centrifugal force. So if it's vertical, if 
it's horizontal, it doesn't really matter. It's m the majority factor at play is centrifugal force, which is allowing the pre-break of the beans with these larger gaps here. And then they go to what's called the finishing teeth. Now, there are times you'll have one or two or three phase burrs. So something that would be more of a one, I guess it would be more of a two phase burr, would be something like this, a brew burr from SSP. As you see, there aren't really pre-breakers. You go straight to these cutting teeth and to the finishing teeth. So with this one, you, can, you should not really do with darker roasted coffees in my opinion. Uh, this is more so for lighter roasted coffees. It's a really slow feed rate as you can imagine because when these two burrs are together, the gap is a lot different than whenever you have these deeper grooves on something like this. When you put these two together, there's a much bigger space for beans to funnel in a lot more readily. So that's going to cause a much more aggressive pre-break to make the grinding process easier. So burrs like this would require a lot less torque than something like this or even something like this. These have just these two big fins right here, which act as one pre-breaker. So you just have just there. And then as you see, they have exaggerated teeth like here, and you have exaggerated finishing teeth. These are the pre-2015 EK43 SSP burrs. So you have differences, as, as you see here, in the amount of pre-breakers, in the amount of curvature on that entry, which dictates the feed rate. You have differences on the sides of the secondary uh, cutting, and you have differences on the finishing teeth. You have differences on ridges on the edges, which can also dictate the throughput of the coffee, which shows how long the coffee stays in there. So something else that people don't really think about is with, with some of these grinders, you have different varying times the beans stay inside the burrs. So the longer beans or grounds stay inside these burrs, the more they're going to get mashed up, the more potential fines. So for instance, an issue on a grinder like the DF83 is the exit chute tends to get a bit clogged and it doesn't allow coffee to escape readily. So ground get caught up and get reground and reground and what happens is you get a lot more fines when brewing for filter. So you want to have a quick throughput. You want to make sure that your chute is cleaned out. If you're figuring out that you're getting a lot of fines on a certain grinder, make sure that it's escaping readily. We don't really know about burrs. It's important to know that everything is just kind of in the air right now. So we can work with what we've got and we can do the best we can, but I'm sure in the future, a lot of the things I say is gonna be proven wrong. Until now, th these are kind of working theories. So often people are thinking bigger equals better. I think this is falling to the same fallacy as cone is chocolate, flat is clarity. Just because you have a 98 millimeter burr does not mean it's automatically better than an 80 millimeter burr or a 58 millimeter burr. I think there is something to be said about bigger has a higher potential in the same way I think flats have a higher potential to create more clarity than cones. You could buy a cheap big burr grinder and it produce a lot worse coffee than something like this or something like this. It really depends on a multitude of factors. It's not clear cut. Bigger does not equal better. I would argue again, bigger equals more potential. There's more cutting area. There's more surface area to kind of play with different cuts. There's more retail space to mess around with. If you perfect a 58 millimeter burr and you're getting incredible coffee because you have a hyper aligned a grinder that has a robust motor that is not gonna vary on RPM during the cutting process, then that might be as good as it's gonna get until we can optimize the bigger burr. So for all of you watching out there, considering to uh, upgrading to whatever is the next biggest thing, don't worry about it. That is not a fear right now. Now, if you're in the minutia that really, you're wanting that extra two or 3% of coffee you're wanting to unlock, or even 10%, because we're probably hitting only 80 or 90 with typical coffees, typical grinders and whatnot. If you're wanting that final bit of percent, sure, you can go ahead and continue to upgrade to bigger and bigger and bigger. Again, in my experience, bigger does not necessarily mean better. These three are the Odes Brew. These three are the Encores Brew. Now, I chose these two because I think they're pretty indicative of very popular grinders in the home. The fellow Ode has been a very popular grinder ever since its release, and it is kind of a stereotypical flat burr kind of coffee kind of grinder in there. I do have the multi-purpose burrs inside to optimize the kind of clarity that people say the flat burrs bring to the table. Over here, I have the Encore, which has been the most, the highest selling grinder like ever in the US, um, and, and sells a decent amount around the world. 
but it gives solid brews. This is the one, the newer one, the ESP. So this has the um, the M2 burrs, which are in the Virtuoso. The ones with markings on the bottom are the Ode. The ones with nothing on the bottom are the Encore. So Misophonia Trigger, do not watch if you don't like slurpy noises because it's about to it's about to be slurp town in this city. We built this city on slurping coffees. Sometimes it goes down the wrong pipe. I'm gonna let it cool for one second, then I'm gonna go one through, one more through. I'm making a switch. So let's see. All right, all right, all right. I got one wrong. My second guess screwed me over everyone. So the ones I switched were the uh, wrong ones. So I got two of three on both, not bad. So there are ways to optimize your grinder regardless of it being conical or flat, regardless of the type of conical and the type of flat. Um, what I found out when I was doing all the particle size distributions for hand grinders is the coarser you went, the more unimodal every hand grinder became. And at one point they almost all equaled out at around 1,000 to 1,200 microns. They were very close to being all equaled out with a really small fine sump and a really big um, unimodality. So this taste test is more so to show you that if you have a cone burr grinder or something that's more muddy, even with a flat, the coarser you go, the less fines will be produced for the most part. When they were hot, the or aromatics on this were much higher, but as time went on and they cooled, I started to get confused because the acidity really started to pop here and they tasted a lot more equal. So whereas these were a bit more blended, especially at their hottest and even into the cooled, they still tasted a bit more blended. I think what was going on is the two I was mixed up on had low lower volume, so they're both really cool in relation to the others. But over time, they do uh, equalize just, just a little bit. Th there are differences between flats and cones, don't get me wrong, but you have to be much more specific on which flats are you using, which cones are you using. I keep seeing people get in arguments online about these great generalizations that are just not necessarily steeped in anything accurate or in reality at all. It's just in shared experiences, which granted is all we really have to work on right now until more science is done uh, and more tests Testing is done in order to figure out more objective connections. But until then, we need to be, make sure that we understand all of this is kind of not proven. TLDW, too long didn't watch? Let me give you a quick little summary. There is no actual generalization we can accurately give to a cone or a flat. We have to be much more specific. We have to talk about grinder. We have to, and, and even when we talk about grinder, when we talk about the burr geometry itself, we're still going based off of experience. So maybe there's a collective understanding of a certain burr tasting a certain way, but even that is not objective. It's very subjective. So take everything you see online with a grain of salt. But that being said, if you're looking to upgrade your grinder, if you're looking into a specific style of grinder, if you're like, just tell me what I need to get for the most chocolatey espresso. Just tell me what I need to get for the most clear espresso. You're gonna be relying on speculation and you're gonna be relying on confirmation bias. You're gonna be relying on people proud of the amount of money they've spent on a grinder and they don't wanna be told that they're wrong. There are cults following certain grinders. It's insane. I have a certain style of coffee I enjoy and there are certain grinders and burrs that I gravitate towards. It's gonna to take trials in order to find what you enjoy and what makes your coffee shine in the way that you want it to shine. So I would recommend using Facebook. There are groups for most of the manufacturers out there. I'm in a group with for Option O's, for Mount Koenigs, for Lalit's, for Breville's, for all these things so I can kind of see user experiences um, of, of these grinders and see what they're saying when I'm doing my own kind of testing to make sure I look for certain things. Things. So I would suggest getting on Facebook, joining some of those groups, get on Discord. There are lots of big coffee groups where they have threads of different brands and manufacturers. You can go on there and ask, hey, is anyone in the DC area that can let me borrow this grinder or that I can come and see this grinder out? If you want it, then you should put a ring on it. If you want it, then you should put a ring on it. Uh, 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 uh. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. I love you all. I hope you brew something tasty today and cheers.